Cool. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to be giving the talk exploring Linux memory manipulation for steel and abrasion strategies to bypass read only new exec and digitalized environments. Uh, probably the title is self explanatory, uh, but what we are going to be doing is to abuse Linux memory in order to bypass some uh, file system based defenses and also to get uh, RCs in, well, yeah, to to try to make it easier to pivot where you are talking about uh, distroless environments. We will explain what this is if you, if you don't know about it. So um, for the people that read this title and doesn't, start, okay, and doesn't understand a thing, don't worry because we are going to be starting from the beginning. We are going to be explaining you why we develop this technique and also how it works so you should be able to follow everything. Also we have a lot of demos. For the people that are already experts in things related to this, I will ask you to wait to the final fireworks because things are going to be getting harder and harder so we are going to start easy and then we are going to start the, doing the complicated stuff. So just wait for the end. Also as you know this is our first DEF CON. Um, so far this has been a great experience. We are amazed with the, with the community, with the conference. So I would like to uh, start this uh, talk asking you for a round of applause just for DEF CON because it has been a really great, great conference. <laughs> cool. So who am I? All of you know about this command I'm sure. So I'm Carlos Polop, I'm technical leader uh, at Halborn. I have a lot of certifications. I was the captain of the Spanish uh, team in the European Cybersecurity Conference a couple of years ago and also a member of the winning uh, European team in the International Cybersecurity Challenge last year. I'm also the author of Hack Tricks, Hack Tricks Clouds and Peace. Um. Thank you. <laughs> And um, I am just uh, a lost nerd in the wilderness. Uh, <laughs> I'm still studying telecommunications engineering. I love Pwn. Uh, I love C, uh, assembly, um, and Linux internals. And I don't think I have much more to say about me. So let's continue. He's great. <laughs> Okay, so what are we going to be talking about? Uh, we will start with an introduction about what the technique, uh, we are going to present you the initial technique we developed called DDXSEC and then we are going to do a lot of demos. Um, all these demos has been already recorded but we are going to be doing all but one live because we really like to do things live even if they can fail so let's hope it will go okay. And at the end we have a surprise. Um, we develop a new technique that we weren't uh, prepared. We weren't expecting to, pre uh, to present in this talk but uh, Diago yesterday finalized the initial step so we are going to be doing a demo and we will expect that it works. Uh, yesterday worked most of the time so let's see. <laughs> okay. So Cool. Everything started uh, maybe two, three years ago and the thing is that I was working in this company and they decided to move all the containers to distroless containers and my boss asked me hey take a look to this new uh, distroless container because they, it, it, is, it is said that uh, it's very complicated to uh, compromise even if there are vulnerabilities in web servers in these containers it's very complicated to compromise them. So take a look to them and let's find out wh uh, what an attacker could do in this kind of containers. So the question was is distroless the new hackable system? The reality is that uh, in that time I didn't know much about distroless, also about containers. So when I started taking a look, I discovered that I don't even have a cell in these containers. I don't have SH, I don't have bus. So I was like man, even if someone finds a remote code execution here, they are not going to be able to execute CAD, to execute LS, to execute uh, who am I. They cannot execute a thing. So to me it looks like pretty legit, it, it's adding a lot of security and I didn't know a way to, to bypass this at, at that time. Also I started playing more with, with, with uh, containers, with Kubernetes and in Kubernetes you have this easy flag that you can set to true which is read only which will make the file system read only everything except one of two folders that have the no exec bit which means that if you manage to, compri to compromise a read exec container in Kubernetes you are not going to be able to download binaries and execute them because uh, in the only place where you can write you have the node execute bit and you don't know how annoying it is as a red teamer to compromise a Kubernetes container, see this Kubernetes token and don't be able to download kubectl and execute it. 
Of course, you can use curl for inside, but you need to use curl to contact the Kube API manually, and it's just annoying. So yeah, it makes your your life much complicated. And at that time, I thought, hey, okay, so I cannot write in the file system, but what happened if I could load something in memory and execute it? There is nothing preventing me from doing that. And I knew at that time that there were a lot of different techniques for do this in Windows. It's super easy to do this in Windows. But what about Linux? Well, there weren't so many, and the words that were in there uh, weren't that reliable. So at that point, I just started my conversation with Diago, and well, he came up with a very a strange idea that ended up working perfectly. But before getting into this technique, let me tell you about the state of the art in that time about how to load things in, in Linux memory and execute stuff. At some point, we found this block from Sector 7 that told you that if you manage to uh, write things in memory, you could use this. Um, cell code using the syscall memfd create that will allow you to create a, a file in memory that is reachable from the file system so you could create a file in memory, load your binary and execute it. This will uh, allow you to bypass these protections. And also while we de were developing the technique that now Joe is going to explain, we found that David Buchanan was doing something very, very, very similar but just smaller. And actually he was using um, a couple of extra techniques that we ended up implementing in our final technique called DDXEC. But at that point, uh, that was the, the state of the art. You couldn't do much and it was kind of complex and, and dark how to do this. So we came up with DDXEC. So <clears throat> the idea that I, that I had at the time was to trick DD into, okay. The idea that I had at the time was to trick DD into overwriting its own memory through the mem file in the procfs file system. Um, it, it turns out that somebody had that idea earlier, like three years before me. It, that was the post um, from sector seven. Um, then I discovered that uh, David Buchanan uh, had a tweet. Um, where he used um, a way to 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 um, to write to, to the memory of the of the shell of Bash or the or, or ZSH. To um, uh, this this has the benefit that it, this doesn't uh, need to disable ASLR because when we when we tricked DD to into our writing its own memory, we needed to um, to tell uh, to tell it uh, at which address it needed to um, to write, and that address must be passed in in, in the arguments. So we need to know um, at which address uh, write before the D doesn't exist, and that was the problem. Uh, with Bash, we have the benefit that Bash already exists. We use um, an inherited file descriptor, and that way we can we can write into uh, Bash's memory and we can check the, the mappings that Bash has uh, beforehand. So, um, uh, well, B Buchanan, uh, the, the, the tweet from Buchanan was, um, what did was um, just uh, write to Bash memory to execute uh, native code, a shell code. Uh, it didn't allow to, to run a binary. So the tool that I made uh, that I had to, to develop in, in shell scripting, um, what, what it did or what, what it does, did exec is to parse uh, the binary and prepare a shell code that will perform the same, the same process that the kernel does upon each call to exec VE. So, uh, we, we need to load the loader in memory. We need to load the binary because uh, each ELF has um, a headers that uh, say the kernel or, or the loader um, which portions of the binary need to need to be in memory and in which address or, and with which prote um, with what protections. So we we create those mappings. We read the data uh, of these binaries into these mappings. We we um, we fix the the permissions. Uh, then we prepare the stack. We need um, the kernel leaves some information for the loader. It is called uh, the auxiliary vector. 
Uh, this has uh, data like um, at which address is loaded um, the binary and where are the headers of the binary and stuff like that. Uh, so we prepare the stack and then jump to the loader entry entry point and the loader will will parse the, the binary will will see which uh, libraries I needed uh, are needed um, then load them and link them and then uh, jump into into the binary entry point. So with EDXEC we prepare all the stuff and let the, the loader uh, do the rest. Cool. So he explained it like very, very easy. Um, just so you get an idea of how complex this actually is, um, all the thing that he said that he's preparing the memory and everything is actually a cell code that is going to be created using cell script. So he dynamically creates uh, a cell code to load a binary inside memory using cell script. I mean, if you read this, it's like, it, it looks like the code is sophisticated, but it is not, it's, it's just super ugly. Um, so yeah, uh, just so you get the idea. Cool, so let's start with the first demo where we are going to be using DDXEC to bypass these, these protections. So what we are going to be running, um, I have a Kubernetes pod running this with, with this uh, read-only root file system which meant the file system uh, read-only and this allows us to download for example kubectl and execute it and we are going to be executing kubectl using uh, the DDXEC technique. So I have the demos prepared here so I can copy paste and I don't break anything. Mm -mm. We are going to get a cell, we are not still in the distro list part so we still have a cell. If I run mount, do you see this? Do you read this? Yep. Cool. You can see that uh, root is uh, mounting in read only and also something interesting is that dev shm here is read write but it has no exec. So even if we have already here uh, kubectl, if we try to execute it, we are not able. So what we are going to be doing is to load a binary with the DXEC in memory and, and execute it. Um, let's just start loading ls for example. So what we are doing here is just uh, base64 encoding ls, uh, sending it to the DXEC and here we have the arc0 and the arguments we want to pass, in this case just das h. So it takes a couple of seconds to run because it needs to, to load it in memory. And sooner or later here we, we just execute something from, from memory. <laughs> so of course LS was already in the system so it wasn't that, that complicated to execute it. Um, the thing about big binaries for DDXEC is that it takes a couple of minutes to run. So here what you can see is that we are going to be running DDXEC in this video just because I don't want to waste five minutes of the talk waiting. So I have just cut the video and we'll show you that you can actually run kubectl. So if you check the last line, we are loading kubectl in DDXEC. Um, this is the magic of video, I just cut it and it just worked and you will have the, the help of kubectl. So you could load even big uh, Golang binaries with this technique. Yeah, the, the problem with kubectl is that um, it is a really large binary, it is like 40 megabytes and um, because uh, DDXEC is uh, programmed uh, in shell scripting, um, all, all the processing of the binary is done uh, with pipes between commands and this makes everything every really, really slow. Um, so <laughs> with QCTL, um, it, it, it lasted uh, running like uh, yeah, 10, five minutes, five minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So th that's why we had to to cut the um, the footage. Um, okay. So um, after uh, after some months, I came up with the idea uh, that uh, DD can be used um, just to seek through the file descriptor uh, that points to the mem file in uh, which is a presentation of the um, of bashes or, or the shell's memory. Uh, so we seek through this file uh, and then write with just um, redirect, uh, redirecting a, an echo or a printf or something like that. Uh, so we can look for um, other seekers. Um, uh, the, well, I didn't see the, <laughs> the slide. So yes. So I'm going I'm going to explain why uh, do we have a pointer? 
No. No, we didn't ask for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, POSIX file descriptors have a really cool quirk, which is uh, that um, when they are inherited, they are in inside the kernel. They are exactly the same file descriptor. The structure that describes uh, the state of of this file descriptor is the same. So um, if we, I, I have here like an example. We have uh, we create um, a, a file txt, and we create a file descriptor, uh, the file descriptor three with read permissions, and then we tell DD to write at offset uh, three. Uh, we tell it to write through the um, through the through this file descriptor, uh, and we tell it to to write uh, zero bytes. When we read from this file descriptor, we w which was displaced, uh, DD performed an uh, LSIC syscall uh, in this file descriptor uh, to this to to move the pointer inside this file to the to the th to the third uh, byte. So when we read, we will see that we are we're reading actually. Um, Three bytes uh, after the the start of the um, of the uh, file. Um, so uh, and this is even uh, th they are two different processes. This this works just because it is the same file descriptor. Um, so now we can just use DD to to seek, um, and we can use other other seekers. Oh. Like uh, tail or CMP uh, files that um, uh, uh, commands that allow you to specify um, a, an offset at which start uh, to reading. Uh, we, we can use them. They they weren't um, useful before because uh, before um, in in the demo uh, in, in David's demo, um, DD was used not only to seek. But to write, uh, and it didn't use this this quirk of the file descriptors. Using this quirk of the file descriptors, we can just seek, and then use printf to write. Uh, well, so something fun about this technique is that now we don't depend on DD. So we found an EDR that was trying to search for this technique when when we release it, and they were looking for DD using big numbers. So it was a very Easy thing to bypass. No, you can even change the DD name to a to a different binary. But actually, we now you can use like ten different common binaries in Linux just to to move the file descriptor and and, and write in any position you want in memory. So this actually allows you to bypass the only idea that was catching this technique and um, potentially the new ideas that will try to catch the the technique. So let me show you very very fast uh, a demo about this because actually in the same DD exec uh, script that we have shown before. You can actually, in the case, in the seeker, the binary you want to use, and it will be using internally this binary. So here we are using compare, and we could also be using um, XSD. There are more, um, there are more prepare inside DDXX, so you can just go to the README and take a look to the ones proposed in there. But actually, any binary that is executing an LSSeq um, with uh, a few other requirements is going to be able to allow you to just load anything in memory. So actually, we uh, develop a very resilient technique in order to load things in memory and bypass these kind of protections. Cool. So let's move forward. Now let's start talking about distroless containers. So if you ask GPT-4 uh, some months ago about what is a distroless container, he will tell you this. But basically what you need to know is that it has the minimum needed packages to execute whatever you want to execute. So if you want to execute a Python uh, web, it's going to have Python, it's going to be having Python dependencies, but it probably won't have bus, it won't have ls, it won't have cat. Let's say that it will just remove all the libraries and commands and, and, and packages that you don't really need to run what you want. So this is great because it makes the container much, much more smaller and also it makes it more secure. It's, it makes it very, very complicated to um, exploit vulnerabilities because we are used to execute the stuff that we expect to be there. Um, that's the problem I had at the beginning before uh, I started thinking about the, the, the memory stuff. So let me show you real quick how a, a distroless container looks like. Um, 
So the previous demo, we have run them in my current macOS, which is ARM. These techniques work for both ARM and x64. Now we are going to go to a Kubernetes environment in, in, in AWS. This also works in Kubernetes environments in the cloud that are in, C, in x64. So this way you can see that all the techniques uh, kind of work in both um, architectures. So I'm going to update the credentials. Um, actually, the pods that we are going to be using for the next demos are this one. We have a node prototype pollution, uh, distroless container, uh, and, and all of them have the read only root file system. This is using the node uh, distroless from a uh, container from Google. This is one uh, using Python, uh, another one using Python. And then we have a PHP that is using the new uh, chain ward distroless images just so you can see that these techniques are working with both uh, Google Distroless and chain link, uh, chain word Distroless container. And also we have a Ubuntu machine inside the same uh, Kubernetes environment because we need to capture some rubber cells to mimic uh, a real environment. So what I want to show you here is that we are going to be getting a cell inside the Flask uh, Distroless container. In this case we have a shell. Some Distroless containers we have some cells, but if we execute LS we don't have it. Who am I? God, it's C. Pass. Oops. Well, you imagine that. God not phone, so yeah. Uh, whatever, uh, you, if you find a cell, just so you know, you can still use the built ins of the cell, so we could be reading the Etsy password using some, the read BTL. And if we try, for example, to get a cell inside the node um, distro this container, we are going to see that we don't even have a cell here. So this is how a distress container usually looks. Now you should be familiar with distress. This is the demo. So far the demos are working, so this is pretty good. Okay. So let's move forward. Uh, let's do this uh, Python distroless demo. Uh, this is the one I'm going to be putting the video because actually we are not using our own technique. We're just using an old technique that already exists, but I want to show you anyway. The thing is that, um, well, if you find a common injection in a web shell, probably it has a, a shell. Just because usually to, to execute commands from scripting languages, the shell is going to be used. So usually you will, you will find this. But anyway, because you don't need, you don't really need a shell. If you are uh, compromising a distroless container and you want a rubber shell, even if you don't have bus, if the, if the web server is running in Python, you can have a Python rub shell. So you won't be running bus commands, but you will be able to run Python code, which is still pretty, pretty good. Also, uh, scripting languages such as Python, Perl, and Ruby, by default, install some libraries that allows you to call uh, to call raw syscalls, and that's actually in everything you need in order to load something in memory and execute it. So this project right here, uh, fileless elf exec, is doing that. It is going to transfer some Python, uh, Ruby, or or Perl. Uh, is going to transfer a binary, wrap it into Python Perl or Ruby code, and allow you to execute from these scripting engines. So for this, uh, for this, in these specific cases, in these specific distroless cases, you won't need to use our technique. The scripting language is enough. So I just want to show you this real quick, and actually we are going to be seeing a video. Here we have a vulnerable Python pod running a web server that I have port forward to my local host. Um, LS doesn't exist. CAT doesn't exist. Uh, using the built-in command, we can see that we have Python, of course, it is running in Flask. So we are going to be getting now, we are going to be abusing, oops, sorry, I wasn't expecting that. We are going to be getting uh, a rubber cell now, a Python rubber cell. Uh, if you're going to be playing with these containers, forget about bus rubber cell, you're going to be getting Node, PHP, Python rubber cells. Here we have it. Now what we are going to be doing is uh, just down here, we execute Ubuntu, we are going to be preparing kubectl to be executed with Python. So we have downloaded the project I just told you about, fileless elf exec. We are downloading here kubectl. Now we execute the fileless execute uh, to prepare kubectl. And actually this script looks just like, uh, looks like this. So basically what this is doing is uh, getting the binary in base64, uh, decoding it in memory, and just calling the syscall 
execute LA to execute it. it. Again, if you can call syscalls from the scripting language, you don't need to do extra stuff to call syscalls. You, you can just do it. So in our case, in our rubber cell, what we need to do is to create uh, a children because if not, whenever we uh, end executing this command, our rep, our rubber cell is going to be dying. So here I'm just changing the the code to well to fork it to execute kubectl in in a children. I'm going fast because we have a lot of things to do yet. We are just starting. So, um, okay, now we are going to be, we expose in this Ubuntu server the kubectl.py that we have prepared. In our Python rubber cell, we are going to be downloading this in memory again. Ta -ta -ta. Okay, and now if we just exec it, we are going to be able to run kubectl in memory in Python. Again, we haven't used our technique, but just so you know, if you find a distro list with Ruby, Perl, or Python, you have a very easy way to just call syscalls and execute things in memory. But what will happen, for example, if we have a node server, we have an express web server with an RC vulnerability? Well, there is no SH in the server, so we can still get a node reversal. Uh, again, get used to getting this stuff in distroless. You can use node to enumerate the, 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 the server, so you cannot execute ls, but you can create node functions that behave like ls, so you can uh, enumerate files. And node cannot uh, call syscall directly, but we could use uh, a cell code like ddexec to modify a new node process to execute anything we want. So what we are doing here is to abuse the DDXEC technique in order to load anything we want, even in node who cannot uh, call syscalls. So in this case, I'm going to be using the cell code that uh, used the syscall create memfd that I told you about at the beginning. We are going to be creating a, a file in memory, then we are going to be loading kubectl in it, and we are going to be able to execute kubectl in another distroless container in, in Node. And actually, I'm going to try to do this demo live, so uh, this is going to be a good one. Cool. So. Let me get, uh, we are going to be in our target machine, Ubuntu. I'm going to be port forwarding um, port 3000 to my local machine because there's where the, the vulnerable server is running. And here, uh, I'm just abusing a prototype pollution to RC vulnerability in order to get a rubber cell. This is outside of the scope, but if you're interested about how to do this, uh, you can check more information in Hacktricks. So it was executed and I forgot to capture the rubber cell, so we had a real problem here. No worries, uh, I just need to restart real quick, which is going to take like a minute. The bus, but now we can be prepared to capture the rubber cell. Yeah. Never forget the most important part of rubber cells, the listener. Yeah. Sorry about this. Um, so Kubernetes take uh, a minute in order to restart the pod. So that's what we are now waiting for. But in the meantime, we can just prepare the... Um, I think he was looking at me angry. Cool. Okay. I suppose this should be now ready. Yep. Okay. Back on track. Um, actually, let me, let me take a look if I have any other listener in there that could be bothering. And actually have one, so this wouldn't have worked again. Okay. Execute it, and we have our node reversal. Great. And now we go with the demo. So I told you that you can use um, that you can use node code, uh, JavaScript code, in order to enumerate the query machine. So you could use, for example, the OS library to get a TMPD or information about the architecture or the network information. So you can still enumerate this distroless code. And you can also execute uh, things in memory, which is what we are going to be doing now. I have the demo here so you can follow it better. So here what we are going to be doing is importing some stuff and we are going to create a new uh, JavaScript file with the code that we want to run and the code, the cell code that we want to roll. So we are going to be using the syscall trick in order to know where we need to override inside the memory. We are going to be overriding the memory via proc self mem. And this is the, the cell code that is going to be executing the, the, the syscall uh, create, mem, create memfd. Yeah. 
So we prepare the file through our uh, rubber cell. We write it in the file system and we check that it exists. So it exists right here. Uh, now we call via fork this new uh, child process that is going to be executed our um, our cell code. Now we want to check if this works, of course. So this is what the function is going to be doing and we can see that we have a, a memory file descriptor that we call dead just to for the sake of a, a stillness I guess. File descriptor 20, uh, proc uh, ID 59. So uh, this should be working. Okay and now we are going to be creating this download function that basically is going to be able to download to download something from the internet, load it in the in the MFD and, and run it. Okay, we download it. It should be working and now if I execute the memory file descriptor it should be executing uh, kubectl and here you have the help of kubectl so we were able to bypass these trolls protections by executing things in, in memory. Um, um, so um, in order to, to make this more, more useful I decided to make uh, like a DDXEC, uh, a, a daemon of DDXEC. Um, so we can just um, load filelessly this program or uh, um, in the end I, I actually made it a shellcode. So we run this shellcode um, <coughs> with any of, the, of, the, of these techniques that allow us to, to run uh, native code. Uh, we run this, er this shellcode and we can uh, tell this, this shellcode to load um, a binary with uh, the argument and, and then just uh, <laughs> we, we will have a, we will be able to, to run any, any program we, we want. Um, uh, okay. Cool. So basically this will allow us to use what I have showed you but to load binaries like more frequently and more useful. Instead of doing everything once and again it will allow us just to send the binary and load it and execute it. So in this uh, final demo before the bonus that I hope we have time for that, uh, what we are going to have is a PHP digital list. We are going to be using the chain war uh, image for this. Uh, in this case we don't have a cell. We are going to be getting a PHP rubber cell. Um, we are going to be loading the new, the new demon. And actually we are going to finalize this demo uh, loading a BC box because we are in distroless. It would be very ironic if we can have a cell in distroless so that's what we are going to end up doing. So let me get, let me show you that in PHP we don't have any bus, any SH, uh, SH file not found. So we are going to be getting a uh, uh, PHP shell and now we are going to be getting a uh, PHP rubber cell. So imagine that we have compromised a web, a PHP web application with a, an RC um, and we got a, a rubber cell with PHP. Da, da, da. Okay, we have it here. And um, now maybe you want to follow the explanation? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so what we are going to do now is um, uh, execute another, another PHP. Uh, another interactive session of PHP, which will uh, we will communicate through a pipe with. Um, uh, we're creating there the, the pipes, and now starting the process. Okay, so uh, this uh, this interactive PHP we will send it uh, uh, commands um, to to write a shellcode also through the through the mem file in in the proc uh, uh, proc f Proc F, proc FS um, uh, file system, um, and we will run uh, this this shellcode that I made. This demonized uh, DDXEC. We we, ha we have the shellcode in ARM64 or um, X64, and and now we have. Um, okay, he he made a mistake. Um, this is far more complex lab you think. Okay. And now we are writing 
the shellcode because there is a shellcode that is a stager that reads the, the other shellcode because the, the second shellcode is really, really large. Um, and now um, I have created the, this function that is called um, MXEC. Um, this function is, is the one that um, is used to, to communicate with this, with this daemon. We can um, throw it um, an URI to um, a binary. It may also be a binary inside the, the own file system. Um, and we, we pass it uh, the arguments and we can, and we can run any command. Uh, in this case we are, we are downloading them from, um, from a server. And to finalize this demo, what we are going to be doing is load uh, a BussyBox cell inside this uh, rubber cell. So what we have here is that now we can, for example, call, for example, call set to enumerate uh, variables or run POWD. Basically, we put a, a bus inside a distro list, which was the, the main goal of this. So we just defeat distro list uh, security measures. So now the, the bonus technique. Um, this is a, another technique uh, that is um, kind of old and new at the same time. Um, DDXEC has a problem that we need to, to pass the file uh, and, uh, and load it. And a loader is really, really complex. I have uh, skipped uh, a lot of um, um, Peculiarities that ELF have uh, um, and extensions from ENU and Sun Microsystems and things like that, they, they, have, they have added, um, that's mayhem. So we, we, you can have uh, like compressed sections and lots of things and DDX uh, isn't um, doing that stuff. Um, so another, another way to, to load filelessly a binary is to uh, use DL open uh, but tricking uh, the loader into thinking that the, the, the binary is uh, somewhere that it, that it isn't. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, a technique that was um, uh, presented in a, in a paper, um, I think in 2004. Um, so, the idea that this, the, these people had was to, um, you have the binary that you want to execute raw in memory, the ELF. Um, in some way, you get to, to hook to the syscalls that the loader is going to execute and, um, and then call the open, passing to, to this function uh, some fake path. Since you are hooked to the to these syscalls, you can detect when the loader is trying to open um, this file path that you have that you have given it, and return uh, a fake file descriptor. And in in subsequent um, syscalls, you can see if the file descriptor that the loader is using is the fake one that you gave it. And in that case, you fake this syscall. So in case um, that you read, uh, that, the, that the loader is trying to read from this file that doesn't exist in the, in the file system, you can just mem copy from, from, the, from the place that you have it in raw in memory and write it where the loader wants to, to read that data. Um, okay, so um, in the paper they didn't discuss how to hook to these syscalls. Um, there was uh, um, someone, his alias was Mimix, um, that in GitHub has an implementation um, that uh, used um, code signatures to find the places that uh, the calls to the wrapper functions, uh, uh, that uh, the, the wrapper functions to these syscalls, and overwrite that calls with, a, with calls to, to its own code. The problem with this is that code signatures may vary between, between libraries and so this isn't 
uh, particularly useful because then you, if you go to, if you uh, have access to a, to a system, you need to download this library and get the this code with this code signatures, and it, it is uh, really complicated. Um, so my idea. Uh, to hook to these syscalls was to install uh, a wrapper, um, to install a, a signal handler for the signal uh, SIGIL, which is a, a signal that the kernel sends to a process if this process turn, uh, tries to execute um, an instruction, an animal instruction. And then uh, go through the memory of the loader, looking for each uh, syscall instruction, and uh, replace it with an invalid instruction. Um, then, so now we are just, uh, we, we have the hook that we need and we can uh, trick LD with uh, just like the paper um, told. Um, okay. Hmm? Uh, well, uh, uh, they also discussed it, uh, discussed it to, to load uh, libraries. The, the, um, but um, if, you, if you make a, a binary look like a library, you can also uh, Get LD to load this uh, this this binary. Okay. <laughs> so later we are going to show you the links to all these tools that we have uh, just show you the DDX segment, the DDL open. Um, but here, just want to show you that this is actually working. So we have here a a Debian container um, that I have already downloaded memdl open dot sh. And here, what we are going to be loading basically is just uh, ls dash la uh, passing in the standard in the, the binary. So, if we do the idea, like this, you can see that it's actually much faster than the DDXX technique. And, and well, we are still are working on this to improve some things. Yeah. Um, this is actually uh, some, a project that I, I haven't dedicated a lot of time. Uh, this needs a lot of research. Uh, I, I have detected that it has problems with um, binaries that aren't uh, position independent. Uh, but well, I think that uh, I will manage to, to fix these issues. Um, cool. So, you want to show the code? Tienes como un minuto. Pues nada. So, um, this is the, the shell code. Um, it, it is long and it is uh, complicated. Uh, right now it is uh, only implemented for ARM64. Uh, there is uh, a proof of concept uh, written in C that is much, much more understandable. You can see the, the, um, the, the, uh, the installation of the signal handler. Um, we have also the um, the replacing uh, the replacement of of the of the the syscall instructions with with um, invalid ones, and we can see here um, how this uh, signal signal handler is, is taken from the stack, uh, all the arguments that were intended for for the syscall, uh, checking uh, which syscall it was, and faking um, e each one. Well, I think you, you have all this code in the in the repository with some comments to help you understand it. So actually the repository you can find it in here. Um, here you have memdl open, uh, remote level injection, uh, well you have it. Uh, we are going to be sharing the slides but if you want to take a quick photo I will leave it for 10 seconds. Um, also, all the demos that I have been doing about distroless, you have them in this repo if you want to, to try them your, yourself. Um, I hope to find some nice CTF in the future using this technique. Um, what else? Um, well, also, Diago wants to share with us a very, uh, well, a pound challenge you have. Yeah, it, it is uh, just a, a fun, uh, really small challenge, um, but I, I think it is kind of weird. Uh, it is really easy to solve, but to understand why it works is really interesting. If you, I have shown it to, I posted it in Twitter and I think nobody liked it. So if you, if you, if you get to, to solve it and, and tell me why it works, I will give you a hug. So.
some final span to end this uh, to end this talk. Uh, uh, me and my mates at Hacktrees are preparing a Hacktrees AWS Red Team Expert uh, certification that we expect to release in Q4. So if you're interested in AWS Red Teaming, just uh, follow us in Twitter, LinkedIn, or go to this page. And thank you very much to, to you people and to DevCon for organizing this. It has been a great pleasure to be with you. Yeah.